Good morning, everybody. My name is Lisa McFerrin, and I'm our worldwide lead for genomic solutions at AWS. And today I am excited to be here along with Louis Collat from Philips, and we're going to be talking about the work that they've been doing and, and our collaboration in terms of precision oncology and how to work with other leading organizations like MD Anderson and build out tools that can help with clinical decision support. To start, I'm going to kind of give a bit of a general preface of what AWS is doing in the, the health space uh, and how we, we organize ourselves and start with some of the opportunities and challenges around precision oncology. And from there, I'll transition over, and Lewis will be speaking mostly about how we can look at being able to leverage that cloud technology and reduce the barriers for the precision care. Um, with this, as I mentioned, uh, the, the work in collaboration with MD Anderson is a real world use case. This is out today. This is not in concept. So what is it that we can do and are doing in this and, and the technical stack and deep dive uh, that makes this uh, possible and available? And we're talking about what's available today, but we'll end in, in that forward thinking and what's, what's going to be happening next in this field. And before I get into the what and the how and the technical stuff here, I wanted to start off with the why. Why are we here? Why do we care? Why are we doing this? And so there's this, this is my why slide here. Uh, Lewis will share his as well. But my why of why I care about this space and precision oncology and the, the tech behind it is to really accelerate that reproducible research and the democratized care. My background is cancer research prior to me joining AWS. And I, I was just so impassioned by working in the field and working with the best and the brightest and what we can do and the, the changes we were making and the discoveries that were, were possible here. But I was also just so frustrated with the state of technology, the time that it took to be able to get to the data, to be able to format the data, to be able to take that algorithm that was amazing that was just published and be able to apply it and get the dependencies in place in the compute environment to test it on what I was working on and see if it was relevant. That would, I would hope, take two hours. Sometimes it took two weeks. And it just, it was infuriating of being able to ask those questions and get to those answers and have that reproducible research of the questions and things that we're really trying to do to change this industry and work with the clinicians to democratize access to that care. And that is what I basically transitioned my career into, is lowering the barriers in data analysis and to facilitate the collaborative and reproducible research really to accelerate the translation into those clinical outcomes. And in that, that's why I joined AWS work at a lab level or a, an institute level, but an industry level of where we sit at the intersection of technology and healthcare. And that is really where innovation can thrive. Each of these industries in the healthcare sciences space are accelerating rapidly and really pushing the envelope in terms of what is capable today in terms of science whether it's advances in machine learning capabilities and quantum computing that allows for better protein folding predictions, HPC environments that allow you to do cryo-EM analysis, you know, and the, the big data and the scale of that big data to actually implement this in a reproducible and timely manner, it's really where these fields come together is where we are working with customers, partners, subject matter experts, you know, whoever's out there, uh, to be able to put that cloud technology to work in this industry. And the way that we've organized that within the AWS architecture is this AWS for Health approach. What this is is an offering of AWS services, as well as our partner network, to be able to align the purpose-built solutions across 16 areas in healthcare life sciences and omics here. You know, we generally talk about genomics or proteomics or um, transcriptomics, so we've, we've generalized this to omics in that space. So how can we bring these things together and align the solutions to meet these industry needs? You know, there are over 200 AWS services and those lower foundational building blocks to help you meet that cloud technology. But it takes a lot of work and effort and knowledge of how to choose the right, right solutions, the right services, and build those architectures. And that's where our goal 
is to help identify that and create those architectures with our partners and, and customers to increase the pace of innovation, to unlock the potential of that health data, and to personalize the approaches. Uh, and, and all of this going towards therapeutic development and care. So what we do is uh, we have AWS has the dedicated industry experts, professional services, our partner network uh, that is there to work across each of these solution areas to deliver the right tools, the right data, expertise, and clearly security in this space to innovate on the behalf of customers, organizations, and patients when it comes back to that. So we always start by working backwards from our customers and their needs, and we work with industry experts, such as Cerner, Change Healthcare, Deloitte, uh, DNA Nexus, Illumina, and clearly Philips, uh, to be able to bring that innovation to life, to bring that to the industry and bring that to the organizations and patients. Now, that's great in each of these solution areas, but it's really important to also recognize that discovery and innovation doesn't happen in silos. That while each of these domains has its transition of moving from that data to information, to knowledge, and it's that level that at each of these disciplines can be transformational, but it's really when you get to the pace of having a, a flow, a data flow between these that is what's going to transform uh, care and fuel those discoveries. The such an integrated system is really going to be what, what is capable then to deliver the best care to those patients today, but also to be able to help inform the therapies and drug discovery of the future that can then become the best of care of the new today. And this is especially true in cancer research and care. Cancer, as I'm sure everybody in the audience probably knows, is, is often uh, described as a disease of mutations. So what does it mean to be able to look at the genetic markers or the, the molecular capacity uh, to be able to better understand it, to be able to identify the biomarkers as well as the precision diagnostics that can help inform that? to then be able to identify those tailored therapies, to be able to understand the proper clinical decision support of the delivery of those therapies, and be able to continue that data flow in order to reduce rates of incidence, progression, and recurrence. And all of this has to come together in that flywheel. Now, genomics, has, there's evidence that it's, it's helpful to uh, include in clinical trial design and target discovery and um, possibly can increase the likelihood of FDA approval up to something like twofold. So there's great opportunities of being able to incorporate all sorts of data into how you approach not just the research, but then also in, towards the clinical care. And there's the need for the amount of data from things like genomics, but also the imaging and the the clinical side to be able to bring that together. And globally, millions of individuals are now participating in these population initiatives to be able to understand that at an individual and population scale, as well as with the underrepresented uh, population groups, to understand the population specific risk factors and pharmacogenomics that can enable things like genome wide association studies and characterization of the complex diseases. Now this is going to help create a rich resource for the translational research and annotated databases that can help with the clinical significance. And it's really through the availability of these biomedical data from large biobanks, the electronic health records, the medical imaging, wearables and ambient devices that are going to really set the stage along with the lower cost of sequencing that can help with the development of multimodal solutions. We don't create data for data's sake. The data is there to be able to do something with it. And it's helpful to have the diversity of this data to increase our knowledge and understanding at a holistic level of an individual, not just at a particular snapshot in time, but in that continuum of time. And so it's clinicians are also using Multiple, multiple sources and modalities of data when they're doing their diagnosing, they're making their prognostic evaluations, and deciding on treatment plans. 
Now, cancer is quite heterogeneous at the tissue level, and much of biology so shows that cells and um, shows cell and tissue specificity. So it's the deep genotyping and phenotyping here that gives that more holistic picture. It provides the context of biology, and it's the interaction of these systems that is important to understand as we are robust individuals and robust uh, networks that can help inform the signaling cascades, the metabolic networks uh, that creates not just a, a single view, but a broader understanding of what is happening within the transition from health to disease. Now, what, what is still a challenge though is how to take this array of information across disciplines and contextualize it for the individual and keep that patient at the center. And so what we're finding is, while this rapid expansion of data is amazing and great, and the growing number of therapies is wonderful to have that personalization, it also creates specific challenges for the clinicians as well as the oncologists uh, and research alike. They need ways to be able to find and access relevant information, to be able to integrate it across those different data types and domains, and easily surface this to make that information actionable and have the, the proper decision support around it. They need the confidence in what they're doing and all the resources to be able to do that. For diagnostics, this includes understanding the clinical relevance and the interpretation based off of the latest scientific findings and clinical decision support. As the accumulation of targeted drugs on the market grows, oncology teams must be able to not just be aware of the available options and clinical trials, but be, be able to prioritize these into their therapy plans. And these challenges are difficult for even the most seasoned oncologists and the, the most premier cancer centers, let alone the community hospitals. And so that's where AWS has been working across the industry um, with, with Philips and others to be able to help address some of those needs. And this is just a, a short list of some of the things that we've been working on. But being able to work on things like mobile platforms and genetic counseling cards, to have patient engagement and education, to have collaboration portals for shared exploratory analysis, uh, better characterize the disease and drug response and patient substratification, manage drug design, cell and gene therapy using structure prediction and, and biologics, um, being able to understand how microbiome may influence the adjuvant therapy, uh, being able to understand how environment and drug interactions are going to matter at an individual level. And then use things like machine learning and knowledge graphs uh, for clinical annotation, for immune response, for drug discovery, multiple ways of being able to address the things that are needed in this field, uh, because there's a lot needed in this field to address the needs in precision oncology. And that's why I'm excited uh, to be working with Philips and Lewis uh, on their precision oncology decision, decision support tool. And so with that, Hopefully that was a good primer, uh, and Philip will go into the details of what it is that he's been working on to help meet those needs in this space. Thank you so much for that. Um, great uh, introduction, and it's really super exciting um, to see all the work that AWS has been doing in this space to really ad advance the field. So, my why, why am I here? Why do I do this? Um, before we, again, we get into the what and the how, uh, fighting cancer with data, right? My background uh, prior to coming to Philips was in um, clinical genetics, informatics, and then um, life science research. Um, again, you know, thinking about um, computational methods for helping drug companies find therapies that can treat these diseases. But the word fighting to me implies action. It implies an aggressive action, right? So I don't use it um, flippantly. And I think that where we are today, there's so much information that we have that's being gathered around patients that we can start to really think about fighting cancer with the data. Today in this country alone, over 5,000 people are gonna receive a cancer diagnosis. 
today. Over 1,500 of them today are going to die of the disease. So the time for action is now. And I think we can actually make steps today. So when we think about the patient being at the center and the care teams that come around. So if you, you know, go to your doctor, you see your physician for fewer and fewer minutes these days. <laughs> at least I find that. Um, and they interact pretty quickly with you. And then if you have something, they'll send you to a specialist, you know, and the specialty will, will, will take care of it. Um, you know, like dermatologists will scrape something off and they send it to pathology. Okay, it's fine. You go home. You see two people. It's pretty quick. If you're one of those more than 5,000 people that receives a cancer diagnosis, your world and your experience in healthcare changes immediately. And it's incredibly complex. I think a lot of groups have had their fingers burned. If you don't honor that complexity, it's hard to make a, hard to make a difference. And what do I mean by that? So if you take like a lung cancer patient, for example. So in addition to their primary care physician, they'll have seen a radiologist. That's often how lung cancer is first detected. A pathologist will look at their biopsy result if they're a patient that should be biopsied. A molecular pathologist will do a genomic analysis. A, pul a pulmonologist will assess their, their function and potentially also could be involved in a biopsy procedure. Um, sometimes they'll see another kind of radiologist called an interventional radiologist, a surgeon, an oncologist. <laughs> so you have nine different specialties coming around this patient. And we're not even talking about the allied health professionals that come in to care for this patient and shepherd them through this journey. It's incredibly complex. And so usually when we talk about this, and I talk to you know, Philips customers who are healthcare systems, we really focus on that. And how do we improve collaboration around this incredibly you know, uh, interdisciplinary team to make care more effective? What we're going to talk about here, though, is the data that comes out of all of this. Because each of these specialties is acquiring information around the patient. So in addition to them needing to come together and share this information and talk to each other, I'm gonna add another specialty in a second. <laughs> They're acquiring this information. So early detection, um, if I, you'll use lung cancer as an example, um, because they're just, you can use a bunch of different cancer types, but we'll, we'll start with that. Um, there are increasingly, thankfully, more and more patients enrolling in lung cancer screening programs, but it's still the minority of patients who get detected with lung cancer. So often early detection relies on an incidental finding. Lung cancer patients tend to present very late if you just wait for symptoms to develop. They often present with very late disease and the outcomes are, are really dismal. If you get it early uh, and you can treat it early, and this is true across all cancer types, the outcomes are just much, much better for patients. So it'll still be an image, but sometimes it'll be an image found because the person uh, fell down and broke a rib and had a chest x-ray and they find a suspicious nodule or they were in a car accident and they have a chest x-ray and they find a suspicious novel. So that's one aspect of early detection of disease. Another aspect, of course, is screening programs. And then there's some interest now also in looking at liquid biopsy or you know, biomarkers that are shed from those growing cancer cells inside the body that shut off into the bloodstream. So that's gonna be a little piece of information. As they get imaged, which will happen, uh, whether they're gonna be treated surgically or otherwise, there's gonna be an imaging follow up to find out where the cancer is, how much is it spread, is there lymph node involvement? And again, you have different modalities here. So commonly, um, CT image, which is that you know, big giant spinning x-ray that people will, will undergo, uh, gets reconstructed to find lung nodules. So cancer cells, when they grow, they consume a lot of sugar, right? So you can tag something called FDG, it's a, it's a, it's a glucose tag that will then light up on the CT in, in a, in a technique, technique called PET. But also in MRI, if you've had an MRI exam, something called diffusion-weighted MRI, which measures water flow, cancer cells will have different kinds of um, water movement around them, and you could also see it there. So you're getting like a slightly different picture of maybe the same event, and you have to put these things together. If the patient is then uh, decided to biopsy, so we have a little bit of data, right? We have the screening data, maybe some circulating markers, some lab values. We now have some imaging data, very little imaging data at this point. Um, but let's say there's a biopsy that's done. So the, traditionally, the biopsy slice is put under a microscope. A pathologist looks at it. They write this 
incredibly long flowing report describing what they see um, under the microscope, but ultimately they're giving the definitive diagnosis, right? So the, the, the 5,000 people today that will receive a cancer diagnosis today will have had a pathology exam that definitively um, diagnoses them with cancer. But increasingly we can digitize that. So that's also, that's great for collaboration, but there's so much information in that slide image. There's so much information in the cancer cells. Lisa said earlier about the genomics giving rise to the phenotype. That's true in cancer. So if you have pictures of these things, you can also go the other way around. You can imply the genetics that might be driving the cancer from the image, from the pathology slide, right? So it starts to give you more picture, but it's not, it's not complete. So then what'll happen for a diagnosis for most cancer patients, if they have advanced disease, they'll be sent for molecular follow-up. So our lung cancer patient will have a couple of quick genes assessed. They'll also assess the immune uh, markers around, a, around the um, cancer microenvironment and the cancer cells themselves to see if they might be sensitive to immunotherapy. And then they'll be sent for a more exhaustive multi-hundred gene panel sequencing exam to see just what's happening. All of this feeds into what we do with the patient. What kind of therapy? What's the approach to care? Right? How do we move it forward? So if you get this wrong, you're going to get the treatment wrong. If you get this slightly wrong, you're going to get the treatment slightly wrong. So we're spending a lot of time in the field on this concept of integrating data, trying to do a better job at precision diagnosis to drive treatment selection. Therapy selection. And once a patient, then once the oncologist decides, they're the decision maker in terms of caring for these patients, how to actually treat, the, how to treat them, they then become monitored uh, and assessed and follow up. So patients will go for subsequent scans, they'll go for follow up imaging. Uh, hopefully, their cancer will respond to the therapy. Uh, if not, they'll have to go to another choice of therapy. So patients sometimes will exhaust lines of therapies or go into a clinical trial and then have to go onto a line of therapy. So we talk about second-line therapies, third-line therapies, fourth-line therapies with, with cancer patients. And then if they do go into remission, unfortunately, there's a high risk of recurrence for a lot of cancer types like lung cancer. So the earlier we get it, the better. The more we spend time on early detection and better management of disease up front, the better. But as disease progresses, you know, and, and, um, or patients are diagnosed later, we still have to do the same job in terms of integrating data and therapy selection. Oops, I go backwards. I'll use this one. <laughs> so when we think about the, um, getting back to our patient, um, the molecular profiling that's done, right? So we think about sequencing hundreds of genes and looking at them at a level of depth because you're not just looking at, you know, cancer is so highly mutagenic, you often have clones and subclones of, of cells that are growing within, within the same, same tumor. So they sequence them at a level of depth that lets you get some idea of what's happening um, with, with the primary tumor and what maybe is happening with some subclonal events. Uh, and then this leads to some prognostic markers. So is a patient gonna respond to a therapy or not? So there, there's a, a well-known one in lung cancer, an EGFR marker that will actually predict resistance to certain EGFR inhibitor therapies, right? Which may imply use another one, right? Um, but also imply drug sensitivity. And this leads to the last piece, which is, okay, now I've got a good idea what's happening biologically. I have a good idea what's happening clinically with my patient. Um, now, how do I think about the therapy side? And this is like the other side of the problem. So if you, if you think about all the data that's surrounding the patient and how difficult that is to put into play, our friends in life sciences have done such a remarkable job <laughs> that there's another problem. This is the number of cancer therapies and new therapy indications that have been approved each year going back to 2000. If you go to 2009, there were eight new drugs and indications approved. I can keep track of that. I can remember eight. But remember, these are cumulative. In 2020, there were 57 new drugs and indications approved in cancer. And these are used in combination. So bad enough, there's, you know, hundreds of possible um, you know, drugs out there. There's, there's hundreds of possible combinations of therapies. Um, 
Some of these are existing drugs using new indications. Sometimes they attack new mechanisms. Sometimes they new cancer subtypes. But there are really hundreds of these that now um, are used to, to treat cancer. In addition to this, and Lisa mentioned earlier, clinical trials. Clinical trials are a great way to treat cancer patients if they're eligible. If they're, if they're otherwise fit for a trial and are able to get access to a trial, um, it's a really, uh, you know, considered by, by ASCO and others a really preferred method of care for a lot of patients. There are over 1,500 active clinical trials currently in cancer. And these are, these are enrolling patients, opening and closing on a weekly basis. And again, because the drug pipeline for this is so active. And so again, that's also quadrupled in the last 20 years. So now we have this like double challenge, right? How do we pull all this data together to get a better picture of our patient? And then with that view, what does that mean in terms of the best course of treatment um, and care options? There's one other thing I wanted to mention, which is um, the famous cancer centers, the ones we've heard of, MD Anderson, Dana-Farber, Memorial Sloan Kettering, places like that. Cancer patients actually do better when they're treated at those tertiary care facilities. Um, there was a study uh, by uh, Dr. Baffa at Yale uh, with colleagues and confirmed a point. They really didn't get into the root cause, but while patients do better at academic centers, that's limited. You can't scale those to reach patients. As much as these great centers are opening clinics and they're really trying to reach their care outside of their walls, there's a limit to how far that can go. 85% of cancer patients are treated in their community. So getting back to our 5,000 number, more than 4,000 are not going to be treated at a major academic center, right? Why not? They're hard to get to. They're often, they're in sort of, you know, uh, centralized cities. They're limited by their physical infrastructure. So this again is where led us at Phillips into a partnership uh, with MD Anderson. So this is another study, which I, I really like, and it kind of explains it, right? So why aren't oncologists, you know, using next generation sequencing results in their actual care? And it was a survey done, this is another thing published by ASCO. ASCO is the American Society for Clinical Oncology, in case uh, folks are wondering. Uh, there's a link to it. And half of the oncologist surveys reported that the test results were difficult to interpret, you know, often or sometimes. Right, so imagine you're one of those patients being treated and your doctor is one of those that says, I have difficulty interpreting the results of this test. A quarter of them referred patients to other providers for NGS testing. Now again, the survey didn't get into why, but there was a suggestion by the authors that this could possibly be due to discomfort with interpreting those results. So again, we've got a great amount of data. The doctors themselves are telling us it's hard to cope with it. So this led us at Phillips into a partnership with MD Anderson um, to understand how they tackle this within their own walls. And this is led by um, Dr. Kenneth Shaw. And they developed an in-house system for their own oncologists expressly for this purpose. So at MD Anderson, they have teams of scientists and experts who look at the literature, they understand the disease biology, uh, what's being uncovered on almost a daily basis in the field, and to make it useful for treating clinicians. So there's a few aspects, but in addition to be able to you know, store and process the genomic results, they really make sure they're interpreted and matched to relevant literature, and, and this then becomes the evidence when we talk about evidence-based medicine. We're not having a machine here trying to decipher anything, right? But it becomes like a super sophisticated search engine that understands the disease biology, the rules that they use have been codified uh, in software, and it lets doctors quickly get access to this peer-reviewed evidence and soar through those 1,500 clinical trials to see what options are available to their patients and make it actionable so they can take action you know, right here and now. Um, uh, patients that are normally going through this process often have refractory disease that are not responding to therapy or a recurrence or have exhausted standard of care um, or are great candidates for a clinical trial at any stage. So we move from the patient to the healthcare technology to the data, and now we're going to talk about how we build it and what it looks like a little bit. So what we really find is that we need 
tools to keep up with the sheer volume of findings, the therapies, and how to implement it. So we take advantage of a few things, and I'll get more back into how we leverage the AWS infrastructure uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, but fundamentally, right, these, these data results are incredibly compute and storage intensive. So it's fantastic to be able to uh, you know, leverage elastic computing concepts in this field, right? We can scale up servers to process these genomic results coming off these sequencers from Illumina and others. We can then store the data in a way that's really, you know, scalable and cost effective for, for customers. Um, so that's like sort of the basics of this. And um, the next step here, though, is these multi-tenant use cases. I talked a lot about MD Anderson and how we can interact with clinicians. We've also implemented these workflows where the MD Anderson scientists can actually look at patient data without looking at patient data. So by using the cloud technology, doctors who have a very complex case and would like someone to say, I'm, I'm confused by this, how do I interpret this? They can request someone at MD Anderson to look at it, and it's like this hybrid multi-tenant mode. So MD Anderson's updating the content and the literature and even able to look at cases without ever getting exposed to protected health information from the clinician that's using the system on the other side. And then the last thing here, which is really important, is things around analytics and data sharing. You know, people talk about cancer being a big data problem. I think it's a small data problem. Meaning, when you start to subtype the disease, and you start to think about millions of people with cancer, but you say, well, how many have lung cancer? And how many have EGFR-driven lung cancer, non-squamous, stage four, that haven't responded to an ALK inhibitor? It's not a big N anymore, it's a small N. So they're just incredibly underpowered studies. So if we can share data between institutions and start to learn from it, that's how we're gonna to get to the next level in terms of understanding what's driving disease. What it looks like in practice, because we're at a conference, you have to have a screenshot of something. So <laughs> this is what the software applications look like. And we really try to make it clinician friendly, right? So, so the docs see something that's um, you know, variant level information with actionability, um, shows you know, they, they can prioritize things to look at the clinical trials, drive trial enrollment, and then there's you know, genotype and tumor type matched um, information included here. So the idea is give them like, not just the sequencing results, but also access to other genomics tests and genomics data, other lab results. You know, another um, interesting thing, uh, you know, cancer is constantly changing. That's why patients will respond to therapy and then stop responding. You know, in breast cancer, there are hormone-driven breast cancers, you know, hormone receptor-driven ones, where patients will respond for a while and then stop. And if you actually look at their cells, they've lost the estrogen receptor, it goes away. So you take the docs, take them off therapy, treat them with something else for a while, and guess what happens? The estrogen receptor comes back and they respond again. So there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's like a time series to this that's incredibly hard to, to unpack. So again, I think we're just at the beginning of these things. So the other thing which I'll, I'll just sort of mention is that, um, just very briefly, so in addition to like the classical gene mutations, um, it's important to include, and we'll talk about some of the newer you know, biologic, biological events that, that are being uncovered, and we need to include these things like June fusions. So, June fusions, in fact, <laughs> this goes back a while um, with uh, imatinib, but basically the leukemia-driven driven BCR able gene complex, um, which are basically two genes that come together, fuse, move to another chromosome, drive a cancer. This happens. It's another thing that happens in cancer that may not show up in a, like, as a standard mutation, but really important. Uh, structural variants. So genes that may have copies of themselves that drive a cancer. Um, it's, it's, it's curious. Um, HER2-driven breast cancer is driven by overexpression of the HER2 gene, which you might see in a copy number change. So exact same gene, just lots of copies of it, leads to overexpression, they can get treated. In lung cancer, HER2 overexpression driven by mutation is what's interesting for treating that disease. So the more we learn, the more complex um, I think we we're sort of uncovering. But again, the, getting back to that life sciences slide, the drug pipeline, fortunately, is, is, is really growing, and we're just trying to, to do what we can to, um, to really keep up with it and make it understandable. So just in terms of impact, these are two papers. Um, they've published it. This is MD Anderson's work. They've published on this, um, you know, and uh, uh, really showing how that these, uh, these kinds of models are used by oncologists in clinical practice. 
And that to me is you know, the most important thing. Like, can docs really access the stuff? And can they really use it? Yeah, this is the last slide of the work, again, uh, from the MD Anderson. Uh, they developed this, again, as like an in-house tool. And uh, it's been, um, you know, th this is their mission statement, right? So created and designed to provide our clinicians with information in real time on mutations, whether they're actionable, and have clinical trials for those that are actionable. So a very simple, concise mission statement, but I think you can get an appreciation for just how hard that is to achieve. I wanna just zoom out a little bit, and then we'll get into software stacks, if that's okay. So when we started talking about this, I talked a lot about you know, early detection of disease in lung cancer and how um, lung nodules are found through um, either screening programs or incidentally, where patients present. And so what's the next question with someone with a lung nodule? It's not how do you treat their cancer. It's do you biopsy them or not, right? So the typical way you biopsy a lung nodule is you, you stick a needle transthoracically into the pleura, you suck out some, some of the tissue, and you have it tested. That's an incredibly invasive procedure. There's like a 25% risk of, or 20, 25% risk of pneumothorax from that procedure alone. So, Lots of groups, the American College of Radiology, ACR, um, other groups have, have assembled guidelines for when to biopsy and when to not, based on how the tumor's growing, what's the smoking history of the patient, are they enriched for the disease or not. Um, but even with all that guidance, about half of the patients are in this gap where they're indeterminate. So do you biopsy them? Yes, no, there's no, there's no clear answer. And so um, we've been working on something, and again, you see some highlights of the screen. So pulling in that clinical data, pulling in the, the, the pulmonary data, the, the imaging findings, but then along with this, adding genomics and proteomic testing. Um, and you can't see it, but behind the scenes is also a radiomics risk classifier to predict whether these patients are progressing toward malignancy or not. And we don't know how docs are, now here's a question. How are we getting genomics data if we haven't biopsied the patient? Nasal swab, which everyone knows what that is now, right? So a nasal swab will actually pick up the gene express, the epithelial cells, uh, express genes in the uninvolved, uninvolved airway, and there's a company called Verisite that's turned that into a gene expression test that is FDA approved, and it predicts whether or not that patient has lung cancer or not. Um, there's a proteomics uh, test as well we incorporate from a company called Biodesics, and there's a radiomics risk classifier which just looks at the imaging features to predict the same thing. Now, we don't know what docs are gonna do with this. We're just landing this in the clinical workflow now. And we have some great feedback. Docs say they're gonna use this in their nodule clinic. And what are we going to learn? Hopefully, we're gonna learn what to do. So what did they do? Did they change their practice patterns with this information? What happened with those patients? Did they biopsy them where they normally wouldn't have or vice versa? And then did they, what was the diagnostic yield? Was there malignancy? And then when they learned this, they'll put this into their practice. Right, so they can then start practicing based on real world data output, uh, based on, again, integrated data imaging, genomics, in this case, proteomics, to drive this one very important clinical decision in the life of a potential lung cancer patient. So I'll talk a little bit about how we build the applications. Um, and we have an application space we call Phillips Genomics Workspace that does a lot of this stuff. It's really tailored, you know, specifically in this genomics world, but again, feeding these other, other uh, multimodal disciplines. Um, I'm super excited about Amazon's uh, Omic service that they just launched uh, because it actually will help us, I think, scale uh, a lot more than, than we have. But we really need to just sort of go end to end, right? So we want to get that data coming off the sequencers. We want to be able to run those pipelines that are very compute intensive and do that at scale. We would then have to call the variants, so where the mutation's actually happening, what's happening in the, in the DNA or the RNA of the patient. Um, and then we move into this tertiary analysis, this integrated analysis that we've done again in partnership with, in our case, with MD Anderson, making it actionable for the oncologists, support clinical and research applications, and then uh, we also have some customers who use this in their molecular tumor board space. So this is built on uh, Philips's HealthSuite reference architecture, which itself uh, incorporates uh, all the AWS services, or all the AWS services that we use, um, really providing you know, kind of a layer for our application uh, developers and engineers 
to build these things out and scale them to our, our user community. And then we built this out further. So if you think about that Hell Suite layer that I just talked about, which is kind of that middle layer between um, AWS and our applications. On top of this, we've then built um, the applications like Oncology Pathways, which is another uh, clinical decision support application. We built that in collaboration with the Dana-Farber, um, uh, subject of another talk. Uh, the genomics workspace, as I mentioned, we've incorporated these things together in a concept we call lung cancer orchestrator that takes docs or takes care teams from that early detection through to treatment and genomics. So you can kind of put those worlds together and start to really start getting population now insights into, into what's happening. Uh, and tumor board applications. So or they really should be called multidisciplinary team applications. So we use um, a variety of backend services uh, from AWS, but something that we built out on the front end, uh, which we really think makes you know, the platform really flexible, is this concept of an open test. Uh, so the amount of uh, variability, even in the genomic space, in terms of how people build these things, um, is, is really uh, quite complex. So the clinical genomics world itself is, is evolving. So it's important for our infrastructure to be able to support that and do it at scale. So we have you know, basically a way to organize uh, work lists, you know, let docs and variant scientists go very quickly through these cases within the laboratory environment, and then integrate this for the um, oncologists who are consuming this. So every lab has a different report template. They have a different reporting mechanism. So we've sort of built all of this all of this in around of you know sort of genomics end-to-end uh, -end workflow for the laboratory, but again the idea is to get this into the hands or the results into the hands of the oncologists, which is what this talks about. So this is what I call cloud to ground. If you're a meteorology fan, this is like lightning, right? So if you're going to land a solution in a healthcare environment, you have to land it in a healthcare environment, you know talked about the fewer and fewer minutes you spend with your doctors. Trust me, they don't want more applications. They don't want more buttons to click. They don't want more places to go. They don't want to log into another system. It's got to really be baked into their workflow. So when we deploy these things in the cloud, we spend a lot of time with our healthcare customers, the big integrated delivery networks, the big hospital systems, the big academic centers, integrating with the huge variety of IT landscape that they have powering their electronic medical record systems, which are accumulating a huge amount of this clinical data, their laboratory information systems, which are accumulating a lot of data for these patients, um, their risks, I mean, you, you can, the, the, the list kind of goes on. But the important thing is to make sure this, these systems are all interoperable to the extent that we can. And for the docs to use it, it has to be in their daily workflow. So if they're used to working from the patient chart in their EMR, it's an Epic EMR or a flat iron EMR or whatever, um, they want to be able to just go patient chart, click the button, use the tool, get the result, get back to work, right? If these things take more than a minute, you're dead. They'll never adopt it, right? So I just came from the Radiological uh, Society of North America conference uh, here. Um, the radiologists are super, super demanding of their systems. They live in those systems. And I think this has given us a little bit of special sauce at Philips in terms of designing these things that are, you know, adoptable <laughs> into the workflow. Um, but anyone who's in this space, I'd really, you know, early on pay attention to this. This is, this is um, uh, essential because there's some great systems that I've seen, some great solutions that I've seen that just sit unused uh, because they're hard to use, they're hard to access, they don't really fit into the way docs are, are caring for their patients. So that's all the left side. So we have interoperability engines and brokers that deal with fire and HL7 messaging. Um, but again, also important to do the integration piece as well so that the workflow itself is as seamless as possible for the docs. And then on the back end, once they're interacting with these systems, we're generating so much data that they can use. I talked about the lung nodule example, but everything we're capturing here is structured. Structured in a way that's very difficult to get out of a lot of EMR systems. So the data becomes structured, it becomes searchable. Um, you know, classic use cases, you have a new clinical trial that opened. Who did you see last week that you just got sequencing results back for? that when they were sequenced and you got the results, the trial wasn't open, right? So you can start looking retrospectively. You could also look in terms of your patient cohort and see, are there patients who you might work with a life science partner in terms of opening a new trial because you have enough patients that fit their criteria. So there's so much you can start doing with this data 
once it's structured within a healthcare institute. And again, I don't want to lose the point earlier around sharing the information across these cohorts. So what's next? Stick to genomics. <laughs> so in terms of what's next, I mean, we're really trying to follow, um, I was gonna say follow the science, but it's not quite right. The science is already here for this stuff. It's following the application, the actionability in healthcare of the science. Uh, and that's for us is what's next. So you see a few different kind of um, looks of things, right? So, so one is how do we get at you know, translocations um, of genes you know, more um, effectively than, than we're doing today? And how do, we get, how do we think about actionability around this? Uh, I talked earlier about you know, the, the duplication. Right? Duplications are sometimes tricky to detect with sequencing because they're looking for changes in the DNA. And if the DNA is just copied one time, so you have two copies of it, and by the way, people are walking around perfectly healthy sometimes with two or three copies of the same gene. No one knows why. <laughs> um, so sometimes it's not, it's not just as straightforward as like just detecting what's, what's not normal because the definition of normal has expanded so much um, in terms of you know, the, the, what we call the reference genome that people are walking around with. And then the last slide, which doesn't look at all like chromosomes or DNA or anything else, is, is um, trying to represent epigenomics or epigenetics. And so genes are turned on and off. So you can have genes that are deleterious, that are turned off, and you're fine. They get turned on, and you're not fine. <laughs> Sometimes the, just the on-off switch will overexpress a gene, right? So this is this whole area called epigenomics. And what this represents, basically, is the DNA gets wrapped around uh, these other proteins or, or methylated, and it makes the translation of the DNA into protein to express it just not possible. So it becomes like invisible to your, your um, uh, cellular mechanisms for making proteins. So this is another thing, again, it's really important in cancer. Um, I'll give you another last little snippet example. Um, liver cancer, right? So liver cancer um, is, you know, again, fairly aggressive. One of the ways you can sort of detect it early is with ultrasound for cirrhotic patients who are gonna be um, in a um, screening program. So not everyone gets, you know, gets an a, a ultrasound, right? It's not part of normal screening. But if you happen to have um, liver disease, you will. And it's a way to early detect HCC, your liver cancer. Now, it turns out that if you combine that test with a blood marker, which is a methylated blood marker, so it's one of these epigenomic you know, kind of blood markers, it's highly predictive for liver cancer. And there's some companies that are working in this space to try to turn that into a better early diagnosis. So again, getting back to this concept of like imaging, pathology, genetic data together, we're I think just at the very, very beginning of it. But uh, I wanna just uh, thank you all for letting me share this and share the story and what we're doing at Phillips with you today. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. Um, you wanna come back up? Oh, there's more slides. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> only, only two. Only Three? two. It's just in closing, you know, we we talked about the what and the the how in the the depth of this conversation, but bringing it back to the why, just wanted to highlight a partnership that we have with Children's National here. That you know, we we work with many organizations in terms of how to be able to possibly affect the lives in this case in pediatric patients, and it's not often enough that we get to to showcase that. So in the partnership with them, we. Uh, are showcasing these child artists, and each of them have drawn a, a picture a, a, around what it is that they're, the, the reason of the why for them, for the intersection of, of health and technology. And we've made each of these pictures into a pin. And so these pins are available in the Healthcare Life Sciences booth. So please go find us in that booth for, we can take some questions now. Uh, there's a microphone off to the side, uh, but if you want to talk with some of our other subject matter experts, uh, see any of our demos, you know, the Amazon Omics solution, uh, there, there's things going on within the booth just right around the corner here in Caesars Forum. So with that, open it up for any questions with the time remaining, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>